We made it to the spinal anatomy. We're going to start off with the osteology of the axial skeleton. You're going to see quite a bit of C another section, pages three through whatever. This is because spinal anatomy overlaps a lot with physiology as well as general anatomy. That's why they have put those together to test because of the amount of overlap in the material. So for the skull, that is all over in the general anatomy section. You can go and take a look at that. That has all of the different osseous landmarks. It has the different sutures. It has the fontanelles. It has the development, all that sort of stuff over in general anatomy. Now, talking about the vertebral column, we're, several of these we're going to split up into typical vertebrae versus the atypical vertebrae. They like to ask questions about the specific, um, what makes the cervical spine different, and then what makes those atypical vertebrae different from the typical cervical vertebrae. And for, we'll do that for each section. So the cervical spine, the typical vertebrae are C3 through C6. They have the bifid spinous process, this two little out pokings of the spinous process. They have these transverse foramen. You'll get some type of question involving the, the vertebral arteries. The vertebral arteries go th run through the transverse foramen. Almost every board exam will include some type of question about vertebral arteries because of the history of chiropractic and all of the the... I'll say that the blame shifted on vertebral artery dissection into chiropractic. Um, they, you still get a couple of questions pop up focusing around that as they want to make sure that you understand all of those structures. We also have these uncinate processes on the superior vertebral end plate portion. Um, we'll talk about the facets in a little bit. Now, when it comes to the shape of the vertebral body, as well as the shape of the vertebral foramen. They like to ask questions about those two things specifically. So the cervical spine has an oval shaped vertebral body and then a triangular or trefoil vertebral foramen. This is also in the cervical spine. It's one of the largest um, portions of the spinal canal is in the cervical spine. We'll, we'll see a couple examples later on as well. Now, the atypical vertebrae of the cervical spine, we have C1, C2, and then C7. C1 is also known as our, our atlas. It does not have a vertebral body. It does not have a spinous process. It has lateral masses instead of a vertebral body. And it has this anterior arch that has a specific facet for the dens of C2. Important thing to note, we'll talk a little bit about movements as well. But the occiput C1, this is our main movement, the majority of the degrees of movement for our flexion and extension of the server, of the neck. You can see some of these different structures that usually won't go super deep into all of the individual specific things. Um, but they, you know, they, they might, they sometimes do have an occasional picture where they'll point to a bony landmark and say, what is this structure? So you might get one or two questions out of the whole four first portion of the test that have some type of image that, that points to a structure. C2, C2 has a couple of AKAs that we want to make sure that we're aware of. It is the axis, also called the epistrophus, or epistrophus, depending on how, on how you, much you want to pronounce that E, or also the odontoid vertebrae. All of those names are fair game for what to call C2. Uh, it has the dens, which we call that odontoid process, therefore the odontoid vertebrae. It has a much larger body. It also has this little lip on the, the front portion that you can see right there that kind of hooks the body, uh, the vertebral body of C3 to really provide stability in that upper cervical spine. Um, as well as these superior articular facets are much more condylar, rounded, to fit that C1. Now C1, C2, the rotation around the dens, kind of it fits right there into the atlas. A ton of rotation occurs 
at our C1, C2, about 45 degrees in each direction. Normal is considered 80 degrees in each direction, so over half of our ro cervical rotation comes from C2 and C1, that connection. Finally, C7. So C7, it is called the vertebral prominence. It has a long uh, spinous process, one of the longest spinous processes in the body. Um, they call it the vertebral prominence most commonly because it is the most prominent server, uh, most prominent spinous process on the spine. Some people occasionally the longest spinous is actually T1, but the vast majority is C7. It has a little bit of a larger vertebral body. It also has small or sometimes absent transverse foramen. Key point to understand that the vertebral artery does not pass through C7. So it starts in, in at C6 and goes all the way up through C1. So this is, this is a really cool thing. Um, this is actually why I personally prefer to adjust CT junction as well as occiput instead of always throwing cervicals because um, you don't have any risk to the vertebral artery adjusting those other regions. Just a little divot that's not going to be on the test. It's just something to think about when you, as you, as you work with patients and start to go things, uh, go through things, especially patients who have a history of stroke or have high blood pressure. You know, do the the adjustments that are the least likely to impact any issues. Continuing on to the thoracic spine, the typical vertebrae are T two through T eight. Remember, there's a tw there are twelve thoracic vertebrae. We look at the vertebral body and um, we look at the, the shape of the vertebral body as well as the foramen. They are heart-shaped vertebral bodies and more circular or oval vertebral foramen. We also have costal facets for rib articulation. The typical thoracic vertebrae is going to have a superior and an inferior costal demi facet. Demi means partial. So that means we have a vertebrae. If we stack another vertebrae on top of that, we kind of have half facets where the ribs are going to articulate. We also have these transverse costal facets. It's on the transverse process where the rib articulates on that transverse process. Those are our typical features, mainly these demi facets, the costal demi facets, that is one of the big indicators whether or not we have a typical or an atypical thoracic vertebrae. So we look at T1. T9 is kind of the in between. It can be typical or it can be atypical. So depending, if you ever get the choice where it says, oh, T2 to T9. If that's your best answer choice, there's not T2 to T8 being the typical, include T9. That's completely fine. It can be typical or it can be atypical, just depending on whether or not it has those two demi facets or if it ends up with a full costal facet instead. So T1, for example, T1, here's T1 right here. We have a full costal facet and, and also it's part of the transition, kind of the, the upper thoracic spine looks a little bit more like cervical vertebrae and then the lower thoracic spine looks a, look a little bit more like lumbar vertebrae the thoracic does a lot of transitioning so that that t2 to t8 are our like true thoracic vertebrae t9 like i said can either be typical or atypical t10 just has a single costal facet, no inferior costal facet at all. And then T11 and T12, these are different. These also tend to only have one single costal facet. Additionally, they have no transverse costal facets. So the, they do not have this little portion here where the rib connects on the, on the TVP because those are the floating ribs. Additionally, they start to change. They look a lot more like lumbar vertebrae and the facet orientation changes from a thoracic orientation more towards a lumbar orientation, which we'll see those specific orientations in just a little bit. Lumbar spine, typical or L1 to L4. 
They are kidney shaped. And then we're back to a triangular vertebral foramen. We have short, thick spinous processes. We have these little accessory processes. Mammillary processes, these are one of the most common questions asked about, specifically because they're a really common contact point for lumbar adjustments. And a little extra tidbit, if you ever, ever asked um, what vertebrae has the largest transverse processes, L4 actually has the largest TVPs in the spine. L5 is our atypical vertebrae, and the reason why it is atypical if we look at it right here, see how all of these other ones are more square, cube-like? They have the same amount of height on the front and the back. L5 is different in that it's actually more wedge-shaped. The front is larger than the back. So we get this anterior wedge shape for L5. The sacrum, not too much to be said about the sacrum other than know the specific structures. There are typically five vertebral bodies that are fused together. The median sacral crest is representative of the spinous processes. The medial or um, intermediate sacral crest, that is our articular pillar. So median straight down the line. Um, medial, I guess it's not labeled on here. Usually it's right in, in here. It should be labeled right there before the, the holes. Those are represented, would be our tip, articular pillars. And then the lateral sacral crest would be the, the trans, correlate to the transverse processes of the rest of the vertebrae. There we go. This is some of the different structures. The lateral masses are called alas or wings. It's what connects with the pelvic bones. Finally, the coccyx. Three to five fused vertebrae. Typically about four is, is normal for the coccyx. And these just provides attachment points for ligaments and muscles. Stepping aside from, from board prep stuff, the coccyx is a really, really interesting bone. Because right here, we have this sacral hiatus where we actually have um, a, a small attachment from the spinal cord that comes all the way down and attaches to the coccyx, or co attaches in this area. Um, I have actually found with quite a few patients that have really strange cases of, of neurological symptoms running down the legs. I have found that especially working on some of the ligamentous structures attaching to the coccyx as well as adjusting the coccyx and using good thumb contact with the drop, um, I've actually had really, really good results resolving some of our, some of those interesting atypical type experience, like presentations of, of issues, especially if the patient has had a fall at any point in time landing on their, on their buttocks. So something to keep in mind from a, a standpoint of patient care the more that you know and the more that you're prepared to experiment to try to figure out the better off your patients are going to be okay that's the the coccyx so if we add everything up we think we have seven cervical vertebrae 12 thoracic that gives us 19 plus the five lumbars that's 24 five more from the sacrum that's 29 and then here 29 plus about four, that gives us 33. There are 33 bones in the spinal column. This can, number can fluctuate depending on the test question, the who's writing the test question, okay? Because technically the coccyx and the sacrum are fused. So a lot of times we'll count those as one, um, one verter, one each. Sometimes even they'll take sacrum and coccyx as um, counting it as one because they're kind of fused together as well. So best answer, in my opinion, for how many bones in the spinal column, 33 bones in the spinal column. 
that is technically the most correct answer. This would be one where if you get an answer choice and it shows 33, I would write a little note in boards and say, this is how many bones are in each section. Coccyx typically has four. Sacrum has five fused bones. Gives us 33. Or if you count these as one single bone, we go the 24, we can say 25, 26, 24 to 26, depending on how the question is asked. Technically, we have 24 bones in the cervical to lumbar regions, 26 or 25, depending, depending on how you count. Um, any question that asks you how many bones are in the spinal column, I would leave a note on it. The two you're going to look for are either 33 or 24. Those are the two answers that most commonly are going to pop up. Just be prepared to explain why that is. Okay, that's all the typical and atypical vertebrae of the spine. We'll continue on talking about these spinal enlargements.